So dear ladies and gentlemen, dear brothers, dear brothers and sisters, Christ is risen. It's risen indeed. In order to listen to the Greek, please choose the Greek channel, or if you want to choose to listen to the English, choose the English channel. The Council of Christian Churches in Bavaria, Germany, and as associate of the Volos Academy for Theological Studies. And on behalf of the Academy, I would like to welcome you to this panel discussion to this round table on the role of the whole Council of Churches, the so-called WCC in the 21st century and the contribution of the Orthodox Church. As you know, the Volos Academy for Theological Studies is committed to the ecumenical dialogue. Many of its publications, conferences and other events are devoted to the dialogue with other Christians and to the promotion of the Christian unity. Allow me to mention and show you one of the most important publications on orthodoxy and ecumenism, the Orthodox Handbook on Ecumenism, which was published with the collaboration of our Academy and the World Council of Churches. As you know, from August 31 to September 8, 2022, the 11th WCC assembly will take place. The last one was in Busan, South Korea, nine years ago. This time the assembly will take place in Karlsruhe, Germany, a beautiful city close to the French border and not too far away from Munich where I live and work. The topic of the assembly is Christ's love moves the world to reconciliation and unity. This gathering will be a historic event, like all assemblies. Please note that the WCC's supreme governing body meets for the first time on European soil after 54 years after the fourth assembly in Uppsala in 1968. This very important ecumenical gathering will take place at a very critical point marked by the ongoing COVID, pand COVID pandemic in the tragedy of the war in Ukraine. When we drafted this event, the war in Ukraine had not started. Because of it, as you understand, the discussion on ecumenism gains further actuality. The conflict raises crucial questions about the attitude of certain Orthodox churches and its compatibility with the ethos of the ecumenical movement. I suppose that the Ukrainian question will not monopolize our discussion, but we cannot and will not avoid it. What is the role of the WCC in the 21st century? What should be its agenda? How does orthodoxy perceive in the variety of traditions of its autocephalous churches, the unity of Christians? And what steps does it consider necessary for its realization and further experience? How can it contribute truthfully to the ecumenical movement? What theological and spiritual impulses can orthodoxy offer? We ask these questions in a time of strong intra-orthodox tensions, strong presence of anti-ecumenical tendencies within the Orthodox Church. Is ecumenism a heresy? Like some people, as some people claim, but also within the new situation defined by the Ukrainian crisis and the attitude of the Russian Orthodox Church towards it. I would like to welcome our speakers. His Eminence, Archbishop Chob of Telmesos, permanent representative of the Ecumenical Patriarchate in the WCC, professor at the Institute of Postgraduate Studies in Orthodox Theology in Champaisy, Geneva, and of Ukrainian origin, your eminence, Christos Voskres. It's nice that you are here. Thank you. I would also like to welcome a Czech Orthodox theologian, Dr. Katerzyna Kotsandrle Bauer, researcher and lecturer at the Ecumenical Institute of the Protestant Theological School of Charles University in Prague, 
currently on Cyprus, like you, you Katerina, Ahoy, Christus, Stal, Christus, Stal, Zmrtvich. Pravde vstal. <laughs> and Dr. Razvan Porum, lecturer at the Institute of Orthodox Christian Studies in Cambridge. I will greet him in Romanian. Christos ein Jat, Razvan. It's very nice that you are here. Thank you very much. We had also announced that Archimandrite Jacques Halil, uh, Jacques Halil, Dean of Palaman Theological Seminary and member of the WCC Central Committee uh, would all attend this meeting, but he had to cancel his participation due to health reasons. Uh, we were informed that he was committed to the hospital, admitted to the hospital, but we hope it's not something serious and we pray for a speedy recovery. Of course, it's a pity that we will miss a voice from the Arab Orthodoxy, but I hope that all the other distinguished guests will give us many good impulses. Everyone will make a statement of about eight minutes. Afterwards, I will give them the opportunity to react shortly to what the other speakers have said, if they want, of course. And afterwards, I will open the discussion, which uh, is scheduled to last till 8.30 Greek time. You know that we Greeks are flexible considering the understanding of time, but okay, this time we will try not to be too flexible. Some uh, advice, the lecture is recorded and it will be soon uploaded on the channel of the Volos Academy at uh, YouTube. All microphones and cameras remain muted. When someone would like to intervene, I could give the floor and our technical assistant will grant him or her access to camera and microphone. I would like to ask already now for short and precise questions or statements. I know it's sometimes difficult in Orthodox context, but we will try to be precise and short. Uh, due to simultaneous translation into Greek, the panelists are asked, uh, are requested to speak clearly and slowly. Uh, this will help the translator. And anyone who would like to ask a question afterwards uh, can use one of the following options, raise the virtual hand, use the chat box or the Q&A session. Now, I suggest that we begin uh, with His Eminence, Archbishop Job. I would like to ask you to give a statement on the theme of this evening, Your Eminence. Thank you very much, uh, Yorgos. Well, first of all, I think before starting discussing the topic of the participation of the Orthodox churches within the World Council of Churches, in the 21st century, it's very important to remind and to underline uh, that we, the Orthodox, uh, are not strangers, neither observers of the World Council of Churches, but we are founding members. And I would like to recall three very important uh, aspects. First of all, we have the very famous prophetic encyclical of the Ecumenical Patriarchate in 1920, addressed to all Christian churches around the world to found a kind of society or fellowship of churches modeled at the uh, Society of Nations that have been instituted in 1919. So therefore, this call uh, shows that the WCC in some, was somehow modeled on the United Nations. Secondly, when the foundation of the World Council of Churches uh, came to be in 1948, we have to uh, remember that one of the architects of the World Council of Churches was Father George Florovsky an eminent Orthodox theologian of the 20th century, a proto-presbyter of the ecumenical throne and a representative of the ecumenical patriarchate of Constantinople. 
and Father George Florowski has did a tremendous work uh, in the organization and in the discussions of the World Council of Churches from the very beginning, um, underlining the need to discuss topics theologically, the need to um, have the Christian tradition as a common basis for our discussions. And finally, more recently, in the 1980s, the Orthodox and the Ecumenical Patriarchate especially uh, were the very first Christian churches to pay uh, attention to the ecological questions. As you know, the Ecumenical Patriarchate established the day of 1st of September every year as a day of prayer for the preservation and protection of the natural uh, environment. And this initiative uh, then was uh, taken over by other Christian churches, including the World Council of Churches, and uh, the Christian theology became very sensible to the ecological questions. So these are three examples that show that in the 20th century, uh, the Orthodox uh, were uh, very active participants and have offered a lot, provided a lot uh, to the ecumenical movement and to the World Council of Churches especially. Now, when we reflect about our participation today uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, well, first of all, I would like, I would hope that we should, we will continue to be as active and to inspire the, the ecumenical movement, the, the work of the World Council of Churches as we did previously in the 20th century. Now, what are the challenges we are addressing today? Uh, Yorgo, you have already mentioned a few of them. Uh, I would, uh, point at three major challenges that I see at this beginning of the 21st century. First of all, it's the problem of fundamentalism, which we see, as you said, with the anti-ecumenists who see ecumenism a heresy. And uh, this kind of fundamentalism was already pointed out by the Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church in its document about the relation of the Orthodox Church with the rest of the Christian world. But we can see also this fundamentalism expressed throughout the pandemic with some Orthodox uh, taking uh, positions against uh, vaccinations or uh, being very friendly with some conspiracy theories. So we see this kind of fundamentalism as also in the field of a certain uh, reservation or a certain opposition to science. A second major um, challenge for today is uh, the problem, the very old problem, uh, which we have to uh, addressed since the end of the 19th century, which is ethnophilitism or religious na nationalism. And we see it today, uh, especially in the problem of the church and state relationship, uh, which is unfortunately, uh, we can see it now with the Russian aggression in Ukraine. And thirdly, we have the problem of secularization which is a global problem. Uh, secularization, as we know, um, the, the, the effect of secularization is that less and less people uh, are coming to churches, are attending churches, are um, aware of their faith. And this is one of the reasons why the Holy and Great Council uh, of the Orthodox Church of 2016 uh, mentioned uh, the need of re-evangelization uh, within the Orthodox Church. And I think all these three challenges are not only challenges for us, the Orthodox, but these are actually challenges that uh, are addressed by all Christian churches. And therefore, I think we have to reflect on these challenges, not only between ourselves, 
but also with the other Christian churches. I will stop here for the moment and then we can come back during the, uh, the questions and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence. Thank you also uh, for this ability to be precise and um, to uh, express all these thoughts in just few minutes. These three challenges, fundamentalism, relation between church and state and secularization, I hope that uh, they will also um, be uh, discussed by the participants uh, afterwards during their uh, questions uh, we will have. Now, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Katarzyna Konchandle Bauer, a Czech Orthodox voice. A um, rather short church, was num was, uh, what, uh, if we speak about numbers, but also a very interesting voice. Katerina, it's very nice that you are here. You have the floor. Thank you very much for invitation. Uh, I will speak a little bit from different angle. Um, I would like to firstly touch uh, uh, the WCC assembly that is ahead of us and bears a beautiful title. Christ's love moves the world to reconciliation and, and unity. I think that the title of the assembly is a very truthful because it speaks firstly about the source of love, which is Christ. Second, about reconciliation as one of the conditions of the real unity. And it helps to avoid also the dangers of types of unity that are dangerous because they are based on imposing the unity on others by force or by authoritarian attitude. The real unity that concerns also the ecclesial one is based on the relationship of recognition and acceptance. There is no acceptance on the other without the recognition of the other as the real other. Uh, I would like to speak about the theological and spiritual solutions just to sketch them that are in the roots of Orthodox tradition and helping, help aiming towards the reconciled unity, even if the official ecumenical dialogue doesn't work because I am speaking from my own concept, a context as a member of a small autocephalic church of the Czech clans and Slovakia, especially the Czech context. It is a very small um, church, autocephalic, uh, autocephalic, historically often linked to Sensir and Methodius. But in the modern history, we don't find here connection neither to land nor the nation. Its members are Russian, Ukrainian, Greek, Romanian, Bulgarian believers. Also Czech converts to orthodoxy. To speak honestly about my own church and my own context, I have to admit, unfortunately, that it's a mixture of not very active of official ecumenical participation, anti-ecumenical tendencies, but finally, which I would like to speak about, especially when the, all the crises which were mentioned appear. Finally, some small micro-ecumenism that happens on the level of personal and spiritual encounters. First, from the official point of view, the Orthodox Church, especially our Orthodox Church, especially during the communist regime, participated in the official movements. But the participation was heavily influenced by the communist ideology and the official government. The, this ecumenical ecclesial, ecclesiality was more used uh, as supporting the communist ideology and the question of real unity was hardly at stake. Of course, uh, I do not want to say that they are not good at political attempts, but it wasn't the case. In 19th, the church was very active in the official ecumenical dialogue, 
but today the church is and it's not active in the official dialogue. We also unfortunately see a lot of anti-ecumenical tendencies that have many reasons. Already mentioned secularization and so on, and suspicious to church um, as an institution. But also very interestingly, that the church is a mixture of immigrants, of some traditional or orthodox families, but also Czech converts to the Orthodox. And those converts react towards all ecumenical attempts in two ways. The experience of personal spiritual journey to conversion leads them to fuller understanding and respecting of other and their tradition. But on the contrary also, some of them consider the Orthodox Church as sufficient enough, is the right one. So they don't need to establish relationship with others or even worse, they feel threatened by participating or cooperating with others because they, it might threaten or it might destroy the idealistic and exclusivistic vision of orthodoxy. This phenomenon is interesting from the theological point of view, as I think. The attitude to others misses the stage of suspicion. I'm using French Protestant philosopher, theologian, Paul Ricoeur. We need this stage after first naivety, the first of the stage of hermeneutics of suspicion. It's needed to be able to critically react towards our own uh, spirituality and tradition and to be able to overcome ourselves to the dialogue with people and others around. However, I don't want to end up pessimistically, but more optimistically. We find some case of non-official ecumenical attempts that happened in particular Orthodox parishes and depending, of course, on the personality of the concrete particular priest. Such encounters happen very often through everyday relationship, something as Vladimir Mosky defined as people only get known each other. But this is sometimes sufficient, not only sufficient, but this is sometimes the only way to the relationship with other and with other churches. The recognition and acceptance of the others happens very often on the basis of friendship. And this is, I would like to emphasize. Friendship as category, even theologically one, spiritual one, that happens out of hierarchical system. And it can be helpful to overcome our egoism, our egocentrism or possession of our own tradition and can bring an open the space for other. And also um, it happens not just on everyday basis, but on more organized spiritual level. The, a week of prayer, you know, when uh, all churches participate or the week of night churches when each other visits uh, churches of the other one and people introduce their own liturgical space, their own tradition. Or for example, which sometimes are also initiate the common practice of Jesus prayer. These are attempts where I see light, where I see space uh, for more uh, grounded, not official ecumenical encounter. And at the moment in this current geopolitical situation, the unity is naturally manifested among churches in solidarity happening towards the needed, towards the Ukrainian refugees. Sometimes I think that the situation of crisis shows that suddenly out of nothing, out of nothing, my own confession is put aside. Because no, it's not important. What is important at the moment is to help the other people, people who are in need. 
It doesn't mean that we don't feel or who have do not feel being orthodox anymore. It just, it's not the only attitude towards the others. The confession doesn't matter so importantly as other, other relationship, other kinds of relationship. So um, that where I can see now that the parish gathered financial material help, they cooperate, they support each other very naturally. So I'm very happy that this example of celebrating liturgy after liturgy together with others can be and is new platform for recognition and also reception of the other of the other. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Katerina. Many thanks for this perspective on spiritual ecumenism. We gained also many very important key words. Yes, uh, exclusivism or a more inclusive perspective. How can we overcome suspicion? What's the importance of friendship and how can we structure friendship? Um, the issue of solidarity and crisis as a chance, so to say, in order to become more open and more ecumenical. Um, now it is time to give the floor to Dr. Rasvan Porum, who uh, will also um, speak about orthodoxy and its relation to the other. Uh, dear Rasvan, we're happy to hear your contribution. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, um, two uh, brief thoughts that I would like to share with you uh, before talking about the role of the WCC in the 21st century and the contribution of the Orthodox Church. Firstly, when talking about the future of WCC, it has become clear, uh, particularly in the past few years, how essential such a platform for dialogue is in the Christian world, there is a great need for a rebooting of the ecumenical movement in the same initial ethos of committed enthusiasm um, as the world um, in general, but um, also that informed by the Christian uh, ethos, finds itself uh, extremely polarized and divided with factions so hostile uh, to one another as to generate very flammable and perilous contexts. As uh, for the Orthodox Church's contribution to the ecumenical movement, this will continue to be, I think, uh, witnessing to the model of communion in diversity, um, inspired by uh, its federative structure of local churches working together as one, at least in theory. Uh, for that to happen though, <laughs> The Orthodox Church needs first to sort out the affairs of its own household as the way it has applied this model of kinonia in diversity in practice has been disastrously deficient, particularly as evidenced at this present juncture in history. After frictions which turned into some sort of schism within the Orthodox Church and after the cruel ongoing war waged by an Orthodox country against another, with the hallucinatory encouragement of its church leadership, the Orthodox Church needs to rediscover its identity, to reclaim its theological foundations and ecclesiological framework. Right now, the narrative the Orthodox Churches bring to the WCC is a cautionary one, a story that tells us what can happen when dialogue is discontinued, shunned and neglected, when the insistence on gathering within isolated enclaves, focusing obsessively on one's particular national or local context, replaces the enact enactment and understanding of a true Catholic and united orthodoxy. Which takes me to what I wanted to briefly speak about today, namely, the relation of the Orthodox to the others or to the other, an aspect which equally affects Orthodox participation in ecumenical encounters, but also to a lesser degree, inter-Orthodox uh, ones and even the, one, even the way they relate to secular societies, I think. Because 
this participation of the Orthodox in ecumenical, pan-Orthodox, or societal interaction, more generally, is partially informed, I think, by an intrinsic fear of the outside, of everything that is perceived as external in relation to the safe ecclesial space. This is an attitude which has less to do with the way the Orthodox relates to the other Christian traditions or to the other Orthodox or to the secular world, but has a lot to do with how the Orthodox understand Orthodoxy as their identity and Christian life. Uh, following their troubled history, the Orthodox churches have come to focus more on self-preservation from heresies as well as from outside invaders, which has possibly led to a default perception of many Orthodox believers that this constant safeguarding of doctrine and tradition constitutes precisely the identity, nature and mission of the Orthodox Church. One consequence of this type of logic, which identifies Orthodoxy with a constant defense against various heresies and a safeguarding of the true faith in spite of efforts from adverse forces, um, is that some Orthodox find it increasingly difficult to define themselves as Orthodox without reference to such adverse forces, whether they be real or not. In order to be a defender, you constantly need an adversary. You defend what you have preserved inside from the enemies outside. This, together with the absence of any serious attempt to reach an ecclesiological understanding of other Christian traditions and the lack of any pan-Orthodox council for 12 centuries has led to a centripetal movement, a gathering within, an attitude of self-sufficiency and an automatic exclusion of most things perceived as coming from the outside, of Christians of other traditions, of the treacherous secular societies of today, even of the other Orthodox. As these Orthodox brethren have become external to a degree, residing in different and remote countries, they too are regarded with suspicion. The partial failure of the 2016 Pan-Orthodox Council in Crete is possibly a consequence of that. And the Orthodox factions opposing it were the same factions who generally oppose ecumenism and whose fundamentalist views make a dialogue with contemporary societies impossible. The pandemic we've just experienced has also revealed a degree of fragmentation, this time closer to home. The fact that the Eucharist was no longer avail available to the faithful, even as a temporary measure, triggered an intense emotional confusion at the level of local communities. In many Orthodox contexts, people felt betrayed by the church as their visible confirmation of belonging to the ecclesial community was taken away from them, which was understandably troubling. They found it much harder, however, to direct the same care outwards towards their neighbors, the most vulnerable of whom such measures were trying to protect. Also, um, while it may seem incredible, the ongoing war waged in Ukraine has painfully divided the Orthodox world with quite a few Orthodox people justifying the Russian aggression. People not just in Russia, uh, following the many years of propaganda, but also in other countries. And they do that either on historical grounds or based on whataboutism, uh, you know, the Americans and NATO have also committed atrocities, so why are the Russians treated differently? That kind of argument. Surely, um, any such justification could only be maintained if one is to overlook the fact that people, even people with whom other Orthodox share the body of Christ, are actually being murdered and tortured as a result of this conflict. What ideology or vision can take precedence before the murdering of an innocent civilian? let alone against a thousand or 10,000 of them. This um, is a perturbing failure on a pastoral level. Now, what is the connection here with ecumenism? 
um, if the Orthodox world has been increasingly informed by a movement within, resisting any movement outwards. Ecumenism is inextricably connected with this outward vector. We are pushed nowadays to reflect on ecumenism beyond its traditional understanding as a dialogue of reconciliation between the main Christian traditions. The pandemic, the violent societal pol polarization, as well as the ongoing war, force us to focus on our local contexts and on ecumenism as a fundamental component of our faith. If we view ecumenism as that vector which continuously spurs us on towards an ever greater Catholicity of the Church as a central principle of our theology, which always strives to maintain the unity of the Church, then the concept of ecumenism becomes relevant in a different light. Ecumenism is ultimately concerned with how we relate to the other, the other Christians, the other Orthodox, the other people in our community and in our society, very much like the micro-ecumenism, which uh, Katerina mentioned um, a few minutes ago. So when seen from this perspective, ecumenism and pastoral care come from the same place. So this is one perspective which the Orthodox can take before hopefully an invigorated World Council of Churches in the 21st century. I will, I will stop here for now, but uh, many thanks for your attention. I would also like to thank you, dear Razvan, for uh, these impulses. You um, argued about the connection between the inter-Orthodox and the ecumenical relations, because I suppose you see some patterns of behavior which um, are decisive in the intra-Orthodox relations, and they are being repeated also in the ecumenical context. The challenge is the definition of our relation as Orthodox to the other. This intrinsic fear of somebody who is outside this focus on the preservation of identity and uh, all this attitude of uh, defending something. And if you have to defend something, you have to define yourself um, with the help of somebody you regard as enemy. And of course, it's not really productive to do so. Many thanks to the three panelists for these contributions. I would like to ask now the three of you, if you would like to react shortly on what the others said, and uh, afterwards we will open the uh, discussion for all the other participants. Who would like to uh, share a short comment? I emphasize the word short um, in order to have enough time for discussion with all the other participants but feel free to comment. I see that Katerina wants to say something. Katerina. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, I would like to just react to Radzvan's uh, presentation of thoughts because I, what I really liked is this very fundamental decision, or sorry, um, discernment between inside and outside. And what, I think it's important to have new hermeneutics of space because we are very much influenced by the dualism of who is inside and who is outside. And we need to overcome it because who is inside, he is at home, he is no stranger. Who is outside is a stranger. So really theological attempts who uh, overcome this spatial dualism, which is very much rooted in uh, languages, at least those we know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. And now, Your Eminence, you would also like to comment, I see. Yes, well, I think Kater both Katerina and Razvan have pointed out to a very important uh, danger uh, which is the danger of introversion. Uh, Katerina, you said, for example, many Orthodox consider 
we the Orthodox are the true church and we don't care about the others. And very often this can be even said to a local uh, autocephalous church. For example, uh, uh, I am a Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox or Ukrainian Orthodox or Serbian Orthodox. I don't care about the, the, the others. And that was already a danger in the 20th century. And the remedy to this introversion was, exa was exactly precisely the World Council of Churches because it was in the World Council of Churches that all the Orthodox churches met again, uh, starting from, uh, well, already in the ecumenical movement since the 1920s, but after the, 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 uh, all the local Orthodox churches became members uh, of the World Council of the Churches after 1948. And this is when uh, we had, after the foundation of the World Council of Churches, uh, the convocation of the Pan-Orthodox Conferences of the 1960s by Ecumenical Patriarch Athenagoras, which started the uh, pre preparation of the Holy and Great Council. And uh, also during these meetings uh, at the World Council of Churches, this is when uh, the Orthodox Church uh, met again uh, with the Oriental Orthodox Churches, the Precalcedonians. Uh, and this is how the dialogue started. So uh, the uh, World Council of Churches is a meeting point, which is a remedy uh, against the introversion, the danger of being introverted and not being interested by the other, even by the other Orthodox. And as a matter of fact, uh, Razvan mentioned the, the crisis or uh, the so-called schisms uh, that we have at the moment. Well. At the present moment, in fact, the, the World Council of Churches is the only field where all the Orthodox could meet together. Uh, we couldn't met, uh, have met all together at the Holy and Great Council of 2016, but we still do meet together at the World Council of Churches. So this World Council of Churches is very helpful for us, uh, the Orthodox. Thank you, Your Eminence. Uh, Razvan, would you like to, con uh, to comment perhaps on what has been said? Maybe just a very brief comment um, to support um, Katharina's mention of friendship. Uh, and this ties in with what His Eminence has just um, uh, uh, said about the fellowship, the, the, the spirit of fellowship that exists in the WCC. Um, and it's, it may sound like a very sort of, you know, simple approach, but it's very hard to, to conceive ecumenism without this interpersonal, um, you know, interaction. And I think that this, this needs to be brought more into uh, into focus, you know, when, when Orthodox people are talking about ecumenism or when they are approaching ecumenical environments, they need to understand that this is not, I mean, there needs to be genuineness, uh, which, you know, should generate real friendship. And in real friendship, a lot of these psychological uh, barriers can be, um, you know, taken um, aside. And, um, and, and, and I think a, a lot has to do with that. So I just, just wanted to, to, to bring this back into, into focus with, with thanks um, to, to both of the other uh, presenters today and for the wonderful ideas they have brought to us um, to unpack in our conversation today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that now it's the time to open the discussion uh, to all the participants. And I would repeat uh, just some uh, directions I have here. I would like to ask for short and precise questions or statements. And anyone who would like to ask a question can use one of the following options, can raise the virtual hand and then I can 
uh, give him or her the floor. Or you can also formulate the question in the chat box, or uh, we have also the Q&A session. Uh, we can uh, do it, or you have um, therefore three ways. Uh, feel free to ask everything. We will not solve all the problems. We I, I think we identified uh, during this first part of the conversation, many very important uh, challenges, fundamentalism, the issue of the other, uh, the issue of space. We need space, we need spirituality. We need um, also to, um, you said Razvan that the Orthodox Church needs to rediscover its identity. I find it very thought provoking. And the question is also, how can we uh, produce a kind of chance, a kind of opportunity now directly in this situation of crisis? We have already one question in the um, uh, Q&A from Professor Paul Ladouceur. Many greetings to Canada. It's very nice that you are here, dear Professor. I will read now the question he has sent to us. There are calls for the WCC to expel the Russian Orthodox Church for its support of Russian aggression against Ukraine. Some Orthodox even welcome this possibility and go on to suggest that the WCC should expel all Orthodox members. What do the panelists think of this? Uh, are other options available to make it clear that the WCC does not endorse the support of the Russian Orthodox Church for the Ukraine war? I think it is a question that was expected. WCC and Russian Orthodox Church, the discussion uh, is a very fervent one. You have perhaps uh, read today that the European Commission is discussing about the issue of possible sanctions against the Russian Orthodox Patriarch. So what do you think? Who would like to answer? Well, maybe I, I, I should start by answering that the World Council of Churches has a constitution and uh, according to the constitution, it is not that easy to exclude a member church. Uh, in order to exclude, uh, you have to have uh, uh, points that uh, show that this church goes against the constitution of the World Council of Churches. It's like it's not uh, that easy to exclude a state from the United Nations if we make an analogy. So this is not that easy. And uh, in the past, for example, uh, we had a similar problem uh, with the apartheid in Africa, uh, and it was not that easy to exclude uh, the, the African churches uh, in, uh, which were involved in the apartheid. Uh, so the problem is not that easy. The, the question is not that easy. Thank you, Your Eminence. Would anybody else like to comment on it? I don't see, uh, or, or uh, Katerina, Katerina. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I don't have definitely clear answer for this very difficult question. Uh, when I think about it loudly, I mean, one thing is condemnation, the public reaction to Patriarch Kirill. And the other thing is if what it would happen if the, if the Moscow Patriarchate would be uh, excommunicated to Orthodox believers, what would be the consequences? Not only those staying uh, in the head of the of the Moscow Patriarchate, but the ordinary Russian Orthodox believers who 
do not agree with the invasion? What would happen? This is a question also um, which we have to ask. Thank you. If I could also share one thought uh, that could also be a kind of question is why are we so much concentrated on the issue of the exclusion of the Russians and not on the issue of the inclusion of the Ukrainians? I think it's much more interesting and important. And I miss many Ukrainian voices. And I think it could be helpful from, for everybody to have also other voices from Ukraine uh, in the WCC. I know it's a procedure. I know it's also not easy, but I think it's a kind of um, uh, another focus uh, I would strongly promote. Not focusing on exclusion, but inclusion. As important is to include as many as possible, I think, and not exclude uh, churches which have their uh, difficult moments, uh, but churches, okay, the, the heads of churches, we should say here. Uh, I see that His Eminence, Metropolitan Ignatius of Dimitrias, would like to say something. Christos Anesti Sevasmiotate. I will be speaking in English. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Admittedly, everything said is very relevant, is very important. One can understand that everything said is authentic. I fully agree with His Eminence's job as to his remarks when it comes to the history of the World Council of um, Churches. And I'm very happy because he pointed out that it was a chance for the Orthodox churches to be brought together. Quite often, Orthodox churches were met inside the World Council of Churches in order to create the conditions for the pan-Orthodox councils. Also, it should be pointed out how the Orthodox presence was always authentic and it affected the history of the World Council of Churches. All Orthodox participants never felt like betraying the Orthodox tradition when participating. A good observant could understand how the Orthodox ecclesiology has affected the other denominations. Now, a few words about the exclusion issue. This is a personal view. I'm not representing the Church of Greece. Personally, I'm never in favor of exclusions. I really, this is what we are trying to safeguard in the World Council of Churches, this possibility to meet, to have a dialogue, to raise questions, to provide answers. And I do hope that our brothers will come to this uh, council. When we tried to reach consensus, we were we were obliged to remove from all the texts that the, the, the to remove the term ecumenical movement. So anything that was about ecumen, ecumen, ecumenical movement had to be removed we had to reduce the texts and the topics because one of the topics was precisely the ecumenical movement. You understand how difficult it was to revise these texts. This is a huge problem and quite often we were wondering, how can you participate in such a council? And when you are called upon to draft a text, 
then completely remove this term that we have all experienced. And the second point, and it is a point of self-criticism, something which is very relevant right now. For many Orthodox people, the World Council of Churches was a source of funds. Many Orthodox churches used efficiently these programs in order to create infrastructure, to build projects and um, uh, in, inside their parishes. And back then they believed that the council was exceptional. So let's be honest with ourselves. We have to see things as they are. If today there is an ambiguity inside some Orthodox churches, there is also this factor, not only the propaganda and ideology, but also material support. That's the reality that needs to be told and needs to be dealt with. In conclusion, I would like to wish that all Orthodox churches will be present in this General Assembly. That would be very important. We have to re-meet. And let me say something that I had said even before the Pan-Orthodox Council in Crete. The fathers that prepared this council had this vision of unity. The next effort that will be undertaken by our successors is for the Orthodox to be able to meet again and coexist within a council. It is very important that the ecumenical patriarchate, patriarchate has not been tempted to exclude anyone, to remove anyone from their position. Let's support unity, hoping that when again truth and the right prevails, we will regain unity. These were some personal uh, thoughts, views and concerns. I'm really happy about everything I have uh, heard today and if i don't speak again i would like to congratulate you all for this round table to close the session uh, but uh, I, I hope you will stay till the end uh, for those who don't know it metropolitan ignatius is also the president of the volus academy for theological studies and uh, together with the director dr pantelis kalaidzidis also I will stay until the end and I would be more than happy to take the floor again. Dr. Kalaidzidis, who is also one of the participants of this uh, session here, uh, are at least this is my impression. All these years I'm connected to the Academy since 2005. It is a form of dialogue of people who are very different, but they have the courage to say their opinion in sincerity. And I think that one many, a main point, a main point also for ecumenism is to be able to be clear and sincere in what you say. Uh, I see that we have many uh, contributions, written questions, I will try to summarize because there are different themes and I think it could be better at the beginning to close the issue with uh, participation of the Russian Orthodox Church. There is a question considering the need for differentiation between uh, the lay members of the Russian Orthodox Church and how can we be clear about the errors of Kirill without alienating the Russian Orthodox people in general? This is a question from Marietta van der Toll, who was also uh, one of the initiators of a very important statement for solidar of solidarity 
for the Orthodox declaration about the teaching of uh, the Russian world uh, that was issued by the Volos Academy and the Fordham uh, University, the uh, Orthodox Christian Studies Center of the University. So differentiation between Russian Orthodox people and the errors of Kirill. And uh, Martin Zip asks also, does Patriarch Kirill's support for the Russian invasion of Ukraine undermine the credibility of orthodoxy? Um, so this is this question. And of course, there are allegations in the chat considering the uh, long discussion about the uh, participation of uh, bishops uh, of the uh, Russian Orthodox Church in, in their collaboration with the KGB or FSB. And um, how um, can we comment on this very challenging situation? Uh, there are, of course, challenging facts. We have a leadership which is being accused of very concrete issues. And I don't want to focus only on this uh, issue of uh, secret services and so on. Uh, there are many issues which have to do with the exercise of leadership now. And how can we differentiate? Because we have also many Russian Orthodox people who are struggling now, and they are paying the consequences of the attitude, of the critical attitude. Uh, and not everybody is so lucky to be safe in the context that most of us are, thank God. Would you like to comment on this? I would like, if you permit me to say a few words, uh, mm -hmm. of course, you are putting here a very uh, difficult question. And first of all, I would like to underline that the World Council of Churches is a fellowship of churches, not of persons. So it means that these are not persons who are members, but churches. And of course, behind the churches, we ought to see that uh, the churches represent not only the hierarchy, not only the clergy, but also the laity uh, of uh, these churches. So for example, if coming back to the previous question, if you want to exclude the Russian Orthodox Church from the WCC, you are not just excluding the patriarch, uh, but you are excluding also the people of that church. But the problem is, of course, that who represents these churches? Uh, these churches, uh, the representatives, the delegations are usually uh, appointed uh, by the synods or by the hierarchy. So this is the difficulty. This is here the difficulty. But we have to underline that uh, the, the members of the WCC are not individuals, are not persons, but are churches. The WCC is a fellowship of churches. This is something very important to underline. Now about the comments of Patriarch uh, Kirill, uh, to respond to one of the questions or comments that was just made, uh, I had we, as I also teach at the Catholic University in Paris, and we had a long, very long discussion about the situation in Ukraine with my Roman Catholic uh, colleagues. Um, and I told them, um, I am ashamed of orthodoxy to see an orthodox country invading or uh, fighting against another orthodox country. And the response of my Roman Catholic colleagues was, we are ashamed for Christianity, because what kind of witness in today's secularized world does Christianity gives if we Christians fight among ourselves? So this is a very, uh, a very important issue, uh, which is uh, intimately connected with our, not only with our Orthodox witness in the, today's world, but our Christian witness in today's secularist world. Thank you, Your Eminence. Uh, Ras Van Poru would like to make a comment. Thank you very much, uh, Jurgis. Um, I think we're, we're talking about 
um, the Russian Orthodox Church very much um, as though it is a passive actor in the context of the WCC. I think we need to sort of um, allow them at least to act uh, uh, like an active, you know, uh, agent to have their own agency. I think, uh, Georgios, what you suggested, uh, perhaps will this idea will uh, reach the ears of um, the Central Committee and the, and the <laughs> of the um, WCC people that indeed adding Ukraine would allow Russia to make its move in a sense you know they will decide what to do my <clears throat> my guess is that they will want themselves to be you know to exclude themselves from WCC which was a position that they presented quite a lot in the past they kept threatening you know um, that they would withdraw as they had prior to the special commission they had uh, reservations uh, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the ecumenical movement and WCC and all that. But um, I think that uh, a way around this could possibly be uh, for WCC to organize events which would be inclusive also of uh, 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 theologians belonging to the churches represented in the WCC, but not only of the hierarchy selected by, you know, um, not, the, not only the representatives selected by the hierarchy to represent the Russian church. Of course, the Russian church includes the Russian faithful. Um, um, so it's very hard, given the constitution of the WCC, to separate the two. However, we could make some of the events a bit more inclusive so that, you know, a space is allowed for some theologians from these countries who may have a different opinion or may carry a different representation than the ones designated by the officials of the Russian Orthodox Church. This is just a, a thought I had and I, <laughs> I thought I'd share it with you. But Georgios, your idea with adding Ukraine seems to me excellent. I'm not sure what the others think. <laughs> Thank you. It was just uh, a thought. I don't think it's original. Uh, many are thinking of this. We are talking about a country of 44 million people, and we cannot uh, claim that we can ignore them anymore. And I think it would be also helpful for the Russian Orthodox Church to see that it is not being um, uh, understood as a kind of special case. As was as it was the case in the past, uh, but uh, it could be good for everybody to know that the same rules apply for everybody, and that we should not always, because of reasons of church diplomacy, um, uh, focus always on the needs, demands, or I don't know, blackmailing of one. Uh, church or position or whatever, and uh, at the same case, ignore others. It helps everybody to know that the rules are the same for everybody, but I don't want to comment now more on this because it could mean that uh, I deliver one more statement. And I think that it could be nevertheless important to uh, focus on some comments on uh, the attitude of other churches. Uh, I see here a comment from Olaf Franke from Germany, who says that the global body of Christ, all the other Christian denominations and communities need the spiritual richness and the contributions of the Orthodox Church or churches. I say this as an evangelical charismatic Protestant and my encounters with Orthodox leaders and lay people have always been enriching and fruitful. Thank you. Danke, lieber Olaf Franke, liebe Grüße on Berlin. And we have also a more provoking, so to say, question here from Sonia Sokirka, who read today that Pope Francis made a comment that the invasion by Russia rests on the shoulders of NATO, as what could they do when uh, the dog was barking at their door? 
How are these comments helpful, especially when a perfectly peaceful neighbor has been invaded for nothing other than gaining prosperity and recognition in the world and actually providing food for the majority of the people? So uh, I think that uh, these comments are reminders that the Orthodox are not alone in the ecumenical movement. The Roman Catholic Church is not a member, but nevertheless, it is committed to the ecumenical movement and uh, collaborates on many fields with the uh, WCC. But um, how do, do we react uh, on the feedback or the attitude of other churches uh, within the ecumenical movement? Uh, how is it challenging for us as Orthodox? Uh, how is it enriching or um, how to say, uh, it could be also instrumentalized as argument in order to say, you know, they are not behaving the way we want them to behave, so we shouldn't have any dialogue with them. Um, how is the connection with the other churches, so to say? Do we have the presuppositions as Orthodox to discuss with the others, to accept also their critique or the difference of their position in general? What do you think on this issue? Because in a dialogue, we are not speaking with ourselves. We are speaking with the other, and the other in his or her otherness may also be difficult and can say good and lovely things. It's good that Orthodox are here, but can also criticize a lot. How do we react on this issue of otherness in the ecumenical movement? Many people say we don't need to discuss with the others. The others are just heretics, or why should we lose time uh, by discussing, uh, in discussing about things which are supposedly sold in the Orthodox tradition. How do we react on this? Who would like to say something? Maybe I can just start and my colleagues yes. can continue. Um, on that specific, on the, your last question, Yorgo, uh, Father George Florovsky, uh, had a very good thought and principle. Um, Father George Florovsky said on many, on many occasions, he said, if we, the Orthodox, believe that we are the true church, then we are obliged to witness to the truth within uh, the ecumenical movement. And for Father George Florovsky, the participation of the Orthodox in the ecumenical movement in the World Council of Churches was seen uh, as a form of contemporary witness or contemporary mission. And in fact, we can observe that the, the Orthodox have contributed a lot to the other churches. For example, today it's, you can see icons everywhere even in Protestant temples, not only in Roman Catholic churches, but even in uh, Lutheran churches and Reformed churches, um, and also the Orthodox spirituality. Uh, Katerina was uh, speaking uh, in her presentation about the, the importance of Orthodox spirituality. The Orthodox spirituality has been, uh, has influenced a lot the other Christian churches. And this is an exchange of gifts within the ecumenical movement. Now, uh, the dialogues uh, which you are pointing out, uh, there are different kinds of dialogue uh, within the World Council of Churches, especially in the Commission on Faith and Order. We have a multilateral dialogue, which means that different Christian churches uh, speak uh, together. And the aim of the multilateral dialogues is to focus on what we share. And as it has been said very often, uh, thanks to the ecumenical movement, we have discovered that within Christianity, there is much more that unites us than what actually divides us. But then there are also the bilateral dialogues when two churches dialogue between themselves, like, uh, the Orthodox with the Anglicans, or the Orthodox with the Roman Catholics, or the Orthodox with the Lutheran, etc. And these uh, bilateral dialogues focus on resolving dividing issues. But I will stay 
uh, I will uh, stop here. I want to hear my colleagues. Thank you. Katerina. Thank you very much again. Um, yeah, uh, the dialogue, uh, we spoken about it. Uh, we have many forms of dialogue. Um, if I speak about dialogue in general as such, I remember the Protestant theologian Dorothy Zella, who once wrote or said that the true real dialogue happens only also if you speak about the taboos you have. And uh, this is something which came to my mind when I teach ecumenical theology and we have students of uh, different uh, Christian traditions, denominations. We somehow um, share richness of our own tradition and people are excited about some of the Russian theologians or Orthodox theologians um, or spiritual Orthodox, but we have to be honest and speak also about fallen or dark forms and periods of our tradition. And then I think the real dialogue can happen. Uh, uh, so to speak and to be honest with our stuff. And it's also connected to redefining our identity uh, as we have spoken about it. So to speak about the richness of our tradition, the peak of our tradition, but also about the fallen forms and periods of our own tradition. Self-criticism may be liberating. It is really important. I see that also Rasvan wants to say something. Um, thank you, Georgios. Just to quickly um, uh, share with you this thought. Um, I think there is um, a risk of, uh, I mean, I, I know the, the position of the Orthodox Church and of the great theologians, you know, who were involved, like George Florovsky, um, in the beginnings of the ecumenical movement. I know that the presupposition is that is that the Orthodox Church is the one true Church, even of the of those who enter into uh, participation with with other ecumenical partners. Um, I think, though, that we have we we could perhaps be a little more humble about um, about this claim, you know, or we should keep it but add an asterisk to it. And what I what I mean is that we need it, it's good to think of us going into an ecumenical context and sharing the richness of our tradition and the and you know the the complexity of our doctrine and, and uh, all of these wonderful things. Um, but we have to also remain receptive uh, to what's going on, and we actually we have to remain receptive in such a way that we ourselves can change, not. Uh, I know that we need to be careful not doctrinally um, uh, and, and of course none of our traditions need to come under any sort of um, you know uh, attack uh, or uh, to be modified or any and I don't mean any, any of that but I, I, I think we need to the Orthodox need to approach ecumenical contexts with more humility and with more willingness to learn if we just go there to teach, I don't think that's really ecumenism anymore. It's its mission, which is a wonderful thing, and there's a lot we can share from our own, from our from our Orthodox tradition to our Christian brothers and sisters. But we need to remain open also to learning, uh, because there's a lot we we we, we can learn on, on a number of issues from our Christian brothers and sisters. Um, so that that's just an just a. a, a an asterisk to add to the one true church, you know, when we enter as orthodox um, ecumenical contexts. Thank you. Your eminence. Uh, I'm new. Just to, just to add to this asterisk, uh, we are speaking of a dialogue, not of a monologue. Uh, so uh, dialoguing precisely implies listening to the others. And uh, I, uh, I can witness that very often the Orthodox, thanks to the ecumenical dialogue, have uh, reflected and responded to questions that they would have never thought of before. 
Uh, this is something very often, for example, I have this experience myself, uh, speaking with Protestant theologians. Sometimes uh, I have to answer questions that I would have never thought of myself. So the dialogue is very uh, is a very enriching experience. Thank you. I remember uh, Konrad Reiser, the former uh, General Secretary of the World Council of Churches, emphasizing um, the positive contribution of the Orthodox to the dialogue, saying that he as a Protestant uh, could learn a lot, uh, and he concretized it on the extension of the basis of the WCC formula, the Trinitarian extension, not uh, this Christomonism, uh, as Nikos Nisiotis would say, but this emphasis on Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and also the pneumatological impulses the Orthodox tradition has given to the uh, ecumenical movement and the ecological ones you mentioned at the beginning, Your Eminence. And of course, I think we also uh, profited a lot uh, by the discussion by uh, uh, with other with uh, other confessions with other churches on this issue we have a question uh, by professor Yaroslav Skira greetings to Toronto he asks are there any bilateral dialogues between churches of the WCC in the orthodox churches that have recently shown promise and to what degree have bilateral dialogues with the Orthodox churches been impeded by Russian Orthodox's refusal to engage in dialogues chaired by the ecumenical patriarch? I think you could um, give an answer, Your Eminence, on this uh, question, on the bilateral dialogues. Yes. Since the Pan-Orthodox conferences of the 1960s, and the preparation of the Holy and Great Council, we have six official bilateral dialogues. We have a dialogue with the Roman Catholic Church, we have a dialogue with the Anglican Church, we have a dialogue uh, with the Old Catholics, uh, we have a dialogue with the Lutherans, we have a dialogue with the Reformed, and we have a dialogue uh, with the um, uh, Pre-Chalcedonian churches, the ancient Oriental churches. These are the six official dialogues uh, we have. Uh, among these six official dialogues, of course, uh, the issue of uh, ordination of women and the issue of same-sex marriage has created difficulties uh, for the dialogue with the Anglicans, the Old Catholics, uh, the Lutherans, and the Reformed. Uh, this is why uh, these dialogues uh, are not so productive, uh, or at least are not so uh, hopeful, uh, because we cannot conceive uh, the, the restoration of communion with these churches because of these issues. Um, in a sense, the most successful dialogue of these six dialogues is the, uh, ish, uh, the dialogue with the Roman Catholic Church, which I preside, uh, and uh, which is very uh, promising. Uh, we have also a very important dialogue with the Pre-Chalcedonian -Pre churches that could be very promising, unfortunately due to the illness and death of their former co-presidents. Uh, these dialogues for the last years were not very active, but we still can hope that uh, this dialogue uh, could be uh, fruitful uh, in the future. Now, you are right that since 2018, uh, there was, uh, there has been a, a decision by uh, the Orthodox Church of Russia to uh, withdraw from any from the participation of any uh, dialogue or any meeting presided over by the Ecumenical Patriarchate. And for example, the Moscow, the, the Russian Orthodox Church does not participate since 2018 in any uh, meetings of the bilateral these bilateral 
uh, dialogues. Nevertheless, the document on the relation between the Orthodox Church and the rest of the Christian world, which has been approved uh, by the Holy and Great Council of Crete of 2016, uh, says that one, when one local Orthodox Church withdraw from a dialogue, the dialogue continues uh, and uh, the other churches have to make an effort to uh, have this church uh, coming back into the dialogue. But the, the, the dialogue is not, um, is not uh, stopped by the withdrawal of one local church. And therefore, uh, the, the, the dialogue continues and uh, we actually uh, will be uh, having uh, a meeting in a few weeks uh, of the Orthodox Catholic dialogue. Uh, so the dialogue continues. Thank you, Your Eminence. Uh, just a comment on a book. Uh, Olivier Clement's Dialogues with Patriarch at Nagoras will be published in English in two months. And Jeremy Inkpen says that it is worth reading his comments on Russian and Ukrainian relations. Uh, he says they are sadly prophetic. Just a, a tip, so to say, the ecumenical patriarch Atenagoras was a great figure of the ecumenical dialogue, a courageous and also a very spiritual person. Everybody who met him can uh, testify on this. Professor Peter Butenev is sending many greetings to us, many greetings from us to the uh, United States. Christ is truly risen. And from the United States, we can now travel to Africa. We have uh, Father Evangelos Tiani from Nairobi, Kenya. He is senior lecturer uh, at the Orthodox Patriarchal Seminary in Nairobi. And he is asking something about the connection between pan Orthodox, inter Orthodox relations and uh, ecumenism. Does it worry the presenters that as Orthodox Christians, we mainly tend to meet when the WCC brings us together? For example, there is no pan Orthodox forum being called to initiate dialogue on matters concerning Russia and Ukraine, which have even affected my own Church of Alexandria and all Africa, which continues to negatively affect us. Does it mean the efforts to initiate this much needed pan-Orthodox meeting to manage this highly sensitive issue will only happen at the WCC meeting, for example, at the upcoming General Assembly? I would add, do we have a structural problem or where is the point here? Uh, is the ecumenical movement the only platform which enables us to meet each other? Or can, can we do something in this direction? Who would like to comment on this issue? Your I, I, I just want to, to say that the, the World Council of Churches is not the only place uh, where we can meet. Uh, my point was to say that, uh, thank God that we have this uh, feel this forum, uh, this fellowship where we actually could meet in an informal way. Uh, at least we have the World Council of Churches. But for example, regarding regarding the uh, the uh, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, and also the conflict. Uh, I think Father is also um, referring to the establishment of an exarchate on the territory of a Russian exarchate on the territory of the Patriarchate of Alexandria. Uh, just before Easter, just before Pascha, the Ecumenical Patriarchate has convened a meeting of the ancient patriarchates and churches, the, the patriarchates and churches that have been established by the ecumenical council. That is to say the ecumenical patriarchate of Constantinople, of Alexandria, uh, of Antioch, uh, of Jerusalem and the church of Cyprus. So this meeting was convened by the ecumenical patriarch who has the duty to convene such meetings. Unfortunately, it could not meet before Pascha 
because, uh, as you know, uh, the Patriarchate of uh, Antioch and the Patriarchate of Jerusalem uh, have uh, misunderstandings regarding the jurisdiction over Qatar. This was officially the reason why uh, the Patriarchate of Antioch did not participate uh, in the Holy and Great Council of 2016. And then the Archbishop of Cyprus, the primate of the Orthodox Church of Cyprus is very ill. So the meeting couldn't take place, but it had been convened. Um, personally, personally, uh, so these are the facts. Now, uh, my personal comment, which is only uh, my own comment, I think we the Orthodox uh, must be uh, serious uh, and take seriously uh, our responsibility and not escape uh, from uh, occasions of meetings, uh, escaping uh, by excusing ourselves uh, with covering ourselves with uh, different kind of reasons. Uh, if we want that our institutional, our canonical structure function, we have to take our responsibilities. Thank you, Your Eminence. Razvan would like to say something. Thank you very much. Um, it has often been the case that the Orthodox indeed could only meet via the WCC. Um, uh, certainly what's been happening in the world in the past few years is a sign and, and also uh, what we've seen happening, um, you know, at the uh, Pan-Orthodox Council of Crete. Um, I think we, we, we need to have a forum, we need to have an assembly of the orthodox um, hierarchs, perhaps not a, a holy and great synod, you know, I think this is, this scares uh, the hierarchies a little bit because it's just, um, you know, the pressure is too big and they need to uh, perhaps, um, you know, uh, uh, commit themselves to, to things that uh, they won't have enough time to reflect on and so on and so forth. But I think we have the model and example of the IOTA uh, meeting, which happened first time in Niash and will happen next year in Volos um, in Greece. And we could see how uh, the, the theologians, uh, you know, uh, without that many bishops could in fact produce a very large and successful uh, meeting of the Orthodox. And uh, perhaps according to the same model, there could be assemblies of, of hierarchs, you know, from the Orthodox world. Um, of course, it would be like um, um, Archbishop Job has, has just said, it would be great to, uh, to have all the Orthodox present, but it, we should not uh, we, we should not al allow, you know, the absence of one or another church or a couple of churches uh, be an obstacle uh, in, in organizing such events uh, in the future. We should, I think, persevere and have similar, I mean, maybe not holy and great, I repeat, that's, that may be a bit too ambitious, uh, given the context, uh, for sure. But we could have assemblies for the Orthodox hierarchs, um, so that we keep the dialogue going in the Orthodox world. I think they will not be particularly successful at first, but uh, I think with the time they could become, uh, you know, uh, something that's common, something that's accepted within the Orthodox world. But it's been 12 centuries, so it has been quite a while. Uh, we have to be a little patient before, uh, you know, normalcy is resumed. But that's that's what I think, and I, I yes, that's a very good question. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you for this. Uh, I think we shouldn't uh, underestimate the work being done by theological academies, like the one hosting us here, which enables the uh, meeting, the encounter of many theologians, clergymen, and people from also uh, from other disciplines. We also need them, even in the ecumenical dialogue, I would say. Um, 
many times unofficial encounters can be very, very decisive. Uh, considering the understanding of time, we all know that we Orthodox are specialists for eternity, but <laughs> all of you would like that this discussion has an end. Nevertheless, there are two questions I would still like to uh, ask. I would just ask for brief comments, although I know that they are vast. Uh, one question is of pastoral uh, nature from Harry Papas. It has been formulated at the beginning of this session, but because of the issue of Ukraine, uh, I think it had to wait a little bit. Uh, the question is, how can parish clergy best help their congregations to appreciate responsible ecumenical encounters in Western culture, I mean, America, in which we are all a small minority, but most who attend worship are not well informed of our own tradition, aside from the majority, who are increasingly ind indifferent to Christ and gospel. I think this is the issue of reception, receptive ecumenism, and what could we say? I repeat, short comments, if it's possible. I know it's a vast last question. Who would like to say something? Reception of ecumenism. One of my professors used to say that in ecumenism, we have to do our homework. Uh, what he meant by that is that, uh, for example, when a commission works on a bilateral dialogue, well, the documents uh, have to be studied at every level of the church. Uh, we cannot just leave them in the hands of a special commission, otherwise uh, there will be no progress. So there is a very, it's very important that the, the fruits of the dialogues uh, have to be received by the fullness of the church uh, from the very high level to the grassroots. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rasvan. I think uh, uh, clergy can do a lot uh, we, because I think there is a need uh, to, to stop perceiving uh, ecumenism uh, as something external. Uh, I mean, in, in certain churches, ecumenism really belongs to the Department of External Relations. Um, ecumenism should not be external. Ecumenism should be incorporated in the life of the faithful. And this can be done by bringing a sort of ecumenical ethos into the, um, into the teachings to, to the parish. Uh, it could be done through prayer uh, for the other Orthodox and for the other Christians. People, I think people, that's why people are afraid of, orth of, of ecumenism because it's something they don't know. It's something external. It's something, you know, almost political. They don't want to have to do with that. But if it's become something more intimate, close to their liturgical space. I think people will become more open and they'll understand both ecumenism and what orthodoxy is all about uh, uh, at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Katerina. Thank you very much. I think I somehow mentioned in my speech, you know, that you have the cases when there are no official ecumenical dialogue, dialogues or platforms, but still it happens somehow. It's not even being named. This is what Radvan just said. It's not, it's not name, but it happens. Uh, it happens when the Orthodox priest needs to build a new roof on the church. Okay, in such situation, which are every day and which happens. Uh, so I think I just given a lot of example in the beginning, you know, and this is the platform which works in those cases where we do not find the official dialogue uh, possibly. Thank you. Considering the issue of interdisciplinary and ecumenical conferencing, Marietta van der Tol uh, from Oxford uh, says that uh, they have dates for Oxford next year, 26 to 29 March 2023. Would be curious to receive more information on this. Thank you, Marietta. Uh, the last question is from um, just a moment, Alexander Milishkovich, what are the main long-term goals of WCC 
do they in any way resemble the purposes of great ecumenical council, councils of the first millennium? Perhaps I could rephrase it by saying, yes, what is the vision of the ecumenical movement? What, how do we as Orthodox imagine the future of ecumenism and the unity of the church? I repeat, I know these questions are vast, but few keywords, so to say, could offer a first uh, access uh, to these very important issues. I would like to say something. How do we think that, it's, that Christian unity uh, could be established in the future? Do we want a kind of continuity to our tradition? Do we think that we need a paradigm shift? Will it be something completely different? Do we want that the whole world just become orthodox? How do we think about unity in few words? Your eminence. Well, I will start. Uh, in the meeting hall of the World Council of, of the Ecumenical Center of the World Council of Churches in Geneva, there's a huge tapestry with the words taken from the Gospel of John that all may be one, which is the final prayer of Christ before his uh, passion, his crucifixion. And uh, I underline the word prayer. This was a prayer of Christ. Christ prayed before his passion that all Christians may be one. And this is the spirit of the fellowship of churches, which is the World Council of Churches. The World Council of Churches, as it has been stressed in the so-called Toronto uh, document, uh, of which Father George Forowski was one of the drafters, uh, the WCC is not a supra-church, is not a hyper-church, is not an over-church, it's not an ecumenical council. So the, the World Council of Churches uh, has no right to decide anything, but it's a fellowship of churches where the churches encounter each other uh, and try to live together and try to go further to try to meet each other in order that they could be eventually become one one in due to in 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 practicing charity in helping each other uh, trying to resolve theological questions through dialogue etc but the world council of churches is at the service of christian unity um, but it's a fellowship, it's a meeting place. Thank you. Other contributions? Would anybody else like to say something on this issue? I see. Uh, Katerina. Uh, yes, I, I think I can just say my some, some words about the vision of unity. Uh, it's again a very difficult question because it depends on what kind of unity we speak about, okay? So it's a hermeneutical question, theological and philosophical question. What kind of unity? Unity based on what? Uh, based on, we have theological presuppositions, Trinitarian theology, pneumatology, and so on. It's one thing. But I, again, speak from my own context. and. Uh, because my church is very small and there is not tradition, you know, as such as a big one. We don't have traditional families, uh, Orthodox and so on. So for me, what I see from my own context, we are in some kind of crisis, some kind of interruption of tradition. And uh, without this makeup, of Orthodox identity, as Mother Maria Skopcova said, beautiful. So what we will do, how we will unite with other when there is no makeup, when our face is visible and we must be honest. So this is the media I'm speaking from. And I think it, we will have to, we will have to find or take step of kind of innovators in tradition at this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you also for mentioning Mother Maria Skopcova of Paris. Uh, 
I don't know how many know it, Katerina has written some excellent contributions on this figure, highly recommended. I would, uh, I think that uh, Rasvan was to say something, or uh, was it? Uh... Yeah, to, to also to, to do with this question, I pondered a bit on it. Uh, I think um, we need to understand that WCC, the goal of WCC is not to unite the churches. It's not, it's not to receive the church and then to sort of uh, combine all of them and produce this wondrous united uh, sort of church of the future. That's not, but this is what also His Eminence um, Archbishop um, Job said earlier. Uh, but the, the goal is to foster the spirit of unity. It's a different thing. It, it shows the direction or it encourages this direction towards unity, towards fellowship of all the churches. So um, in, in this sense, uh, it, it will never be a united church. That's not the purpose of it. The purpose is to encourage the tendency, the movement towards unity and towards fellowship of all the Christians. So that's what I wanted to add. And I would like to thank you all for your participation to this very enriching discussion I would like uh, to thank also uh, not only the panelists, but also the participants. And I would also like to ask His Eminence, Metropolitan Ignatius of Dimitrias, President of the Volos Academy, to say some closing words. Sevas Miotate. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank you for Mr. Vladis for this excellent moderation. Thank you for the cooperation, the Academy of Theological Studies of Olos. I would like to congratulate the panelists. They safeguarded precisely the spirit of dialogue and ecumenism, how we can offer a little bit from ourselves to the other in order to help them understand. It is difficult in local churches uh, to disseminate ecumenism. It has always been difficult to disseminate this idea among believers. Quite often, these facts, these ideas remain privy to only those engaged in this dialogue. So it is an issue that we have to tackle. Of course, the assembly in Germany is um, very important. When it was being planned, nobody could have expected the difficulties and the conjecture in which it would take place. Fundamentalism is everywhere throughout the Christian world. And of course, the, the, the Islamic fundamentalism is added to that. So secular, secularization is also has an impact on everything. And I do believe that nationalism as well, you see what happens in many European areas, nationalism, as you very well pointed out, is something that we should uh, handled, especially under the prism of the current conjecture. So there are many hard issues that we don't know how they will involve until August. This is why this event is very important. When we planned this event, we didn't even know that uh, it would be so relevant. So thank you very much. And I do hope that the that um, we are very happy that Volos will host this very big theological meeting. We want you all here next to us.
And I do hope that uh, we should all understand that we have responsibility right now to, to move towards unity, avoid exclusions, and at the same time, at least allow the, the souls of people to rest. I do hope that God enlightens leaders and especially church leaders to understand their responsibility and make this discussion food for thought. Christ is risen. Thank you very much.